um, thanks for inviting me here today to talk to you. Um, so, so I'll start off with this photo. Um, it, apart from just being a, a nice photo to look at, it, you can get a good um, idea for a lot of the, the water resource issues in New Zealand, um, or the, the characteristics of, of water resources from the photo. Obviously right in the middle, um, we've got the highest mountain in New Zealand, Araki Mount Cook, at just over 3,700 metres. Um, and so that's the, the highest point on the Southern Alps, which go along the, the length of the South Island, um, giving a, a substantial snow and ice um, coverage and having a big impact on, on the, the hydrology of the country from that. The Southern Alps also form a barrier to the prevailing westerly circulation and you can just see the clouds uh, banking up against the Southern Alps, delivering a lot of rain to the, to the west coast. If we were to fast forward this uh, ahead six hours or so, then we'd start to see some spillover rain um, uh, on, the, on the leeward side of the mountains too. In the foreground, it's actually quite green, unusually green for this location because there's actually a, a really strong rain shadow effect from those Southern Alps. So we've got lots of water coming through it. Um, one of the, the, the major rivers in the South Island uh, starts here, but it's fed by water that falls over the main divide. It's actually relatively dry here, but that water that, that flows down towards the East Coast um, is used intensively for hydropower and for irrigation. So lots of downstream water uses and, and water management challenges uh, associated with the water that falls over these mountains. So my talk today, uh, this worked before. Um, yep, let's use the keyboard instead. Right, here we go. Uh, so so um, my talk today is going to talk about a series of water resource issues focusing on hazards, so floods and droughts across New Zealand. And so really thinking about where that water comes from that causes um, high flow, high rain flood events, um, and then where does it go? How do we end up with, with challenges uh, managing lack of, a lack of water um, in, in downwind locations? So a useful way to do that is to kind of go on a journey from west to east, from that west, wet west towards the dry east. Um, and so it's quite a local focus, um, but there's more general relevance because everywhere has floods and droughts. Um, there's a, a you know, universal challenge of understanding where those high rainfall events come from um, and then how we manage that water. Um, for, for economic activity, for generating electricity, um, or for, for more amenity value, I suppose. So um, I'll start off talking about the role of the, the general westerly circulation um, and the transport of moisture within that, and then the, the modification of those meteorological inputs and outputs um, in terms of water withdrawals and, and land use change and how we characterise and quantify those to, to understand what processes are actually causing us to have too much or, or not enough water. So to start off with some, some um, basic physical geography of the country, we've got a map of mean annual temperature here but it shows really clearly the, the topography of the country. So in the South Island we've got the, the Southern Alps here um, going along the, the spine of the country, and then a smaller, smaller ranges, but a similar orientation in, in the North Island. And it really picks out the changes in temperature quite clearly. Obviously, as we go up, it gets much colder. So the, I'm going to focus mostly on, on the South Island and the Southern Alps. They're, they're not small, um, peaking just over 3,700 metres. They're not... Um, major by global standards in comparison to the, the, the Andes or, or the Himalayas. 
but they are very steep. So they go from, um, from coast to, the, to the, the peak of the main divide in about 30 kilometers, 18 miles. So uh, it's a, a steep barrier. Um, and so that also affects the, the precipitation climatology of the country. Um, from the, the west coast, where there might be three to 4,000 millimetres of rain a year, um, up towards the main divide, the, the wettest rain gauge records just under um, 12,000 millimetres, so 12 metres of water a year. Um, it gets wetter as you go up, and it's somewhere in the region of 15 metres a year but there aren't actually any gauges in, in that, those very wettest parts. And then there's a strong rain shadow behind it where um, mean annual rainfall drops from those really high totals down to um, minima of maybe 400 millimetres a year, so into semi-arid conditions um, over very short um, distances. So we've got um, gradients in, in temperature and precipitation um, and we've also got, we've, we've got that, that change in altitude. And so that, combined with the, the temperate location, means that, there are, um, that snow and ice are important. So there are actually thousands of glaciers um, along the Southern Alps, but most of them are tiny, um, smaller than a square kilometre, and, and wasting rapidly at the moment. There are a couple of larger ones, the Tasman Glacier, um, which was just about in shot with that first picture I showed you, flowing for about 20 kilometres um, east of the main divide. And then there are a couple of larger ones, la well, not quite as large, about 10 kilometres long, flowing down close to sea level um, on the western side, fed by these really high precipitation rates. From a, a water resources perspective, though, it's the, the seasonal snow cover that's, that's most important. So the snow line varies between about 1,000 and 2,000 metres from, from winter into summer. Um, and over the, the winter half year, um, a, approximately four metres water equivalent of snow accumulates over the Southern Alps, and then that melts out over the spring into the summer, providing a, a, a really strong snowmelt peak to some of those alpine rivers. Um, that, that have their headwaters along here and some flow down the short distance to the west coast and, and others flow down to the east coast um, through much drier regions. So, um, so the, the basic uh, hydrological, climatological um, features, what makes it um, either wet or dry um, across much of the country can really be characterised by the pressure gradient along the axis of these, um, of these mountain ranges. And so if we uh, calculate uh, a pressure index um, from handily placed weather stations, then we can get, we can get indices which we can use to characterise um, how wet or dry it is. They were first formulated um, in the, the late 1970s by um, Kevin Trimberth, um, so they're called the Trembirth Indices, uh, MZ, because they part meridional, part zonal. We also have other zonal and meridional indices that we can use to describe the climate of New Zealand. So these have quite strong relationships. Um, if we plot um, geopotential height anomalies or, or correlations uh, with, with rainfall records or river flow records, um, we, can, we can throw different statistical techniques at it, um, correlation or, or wavelet analysis to be a bit more sophisticated uh, between these MZ indices and, and various hydrological time series, picking out, um, picking out the, the nature of these um, relationships. So on a, a general sort of monthly average perspective, we've got this, this strong relationship to um, this northeast to southwest pressure gradient. But behind those, those um, monthly average relationships, there are a couple of different um, key mechanisms for delivery of water for, for the, the weather systems that actually deliver um, that water to the country. And there are um, two, two key uh, situations. One here where we've got this um, low pressure system kind of moving 
from uh, northwest to, to southeast, giving us that pressure gradient. Here we've got some trajectories associated with that. So it's a, a, a backwards trajectory uh, from an air parcel located over the catchment at the time of the flood, uh, going back in time um, by, I think that's six hours, another six hours, another six hours. So we can see where the air came from. And we can, this is, it comes from um, a, a data set rather than actually an observation, but we can launch these trajectories in the model at um, a number of different times across the duration of the flow event to see um, how that passage of water into the catchment varies. So we've got this, this one trajectory that's pre predominantly northerly flow into the catchment and then another that's much more associated with westerly, um, with the westerlies. So we've got much stronger westerlies um, over the country and a more westerly trajectory. But still a sort of uh, northeast to southwest pressure gradient. So di different mechanisms but within the same general large scale situation. So these weather systems um, deliver lots of water to the country. This is um, a, a slightly different way of looking at mean annual rainfall, just um, a series of station averages. And we can see the, the, the outline of the Southern Alps being picked up here with our, our wettest station, just under 12 metres. We've got our mean daily rainfall, again, across a transect of the Southern Alps. And our, our wettest stations our mean daily rainfall of 30 to 35 millimetres. Um, so that's a lot, of, a lot of water because obviously we don't get our mean rainfall every day. It, it comes in stops and starts. Um, the, the biggest rainfall um, event on record happened earlier this year um, where over the course of 24 hours um, just over 1,000 millimetres of rain was, was um, delivered to the west coast which had some quite substantial implications. Um, it's obviously a very extreme event, um, but it wasn't that much more extreme than the, the second or the third ranked extreme events. So, so it was big, but it wasn't completely out there. It wasn't an, an outlier extreme event. It was just um, consistent with, with the existing distribution. So lots of water. Um, why? Why do these weather systems deliver so much water? From a, a climatological perspective, it's a, it's, a, it's a country, it's in the middle of the ocean, um, but why does it get so much more, to, more water than, let's say, northwestern Europe, which is also on the, the downwind side of a, a big ocean in the predominantly westerly circulation? Well, the, the mechanism that delivers all of this water um, uh, is um, uh, atmospheric rivers, which are, um, well, you can see them here. So we've got um, total precipitable water here. Um, and we can see in the mid-latitudes these series of, of long, thin um, filaments of, um, of high concentrations of water. So at, at any given point, there are somewhere between five and 10 of these in, in existence. They, they transport water through the atmosphere at, at flow rates equivalent to the, the world's largest rivers, or slightly larger even. Um, but they're, they're transient, so they're not, they're not fixed in, in space. They, they move with the general westerly circulation. They, they dissipate and, and, and they generate according to um, variation in mid-latitude weather systems. Um, and they they're the, the, the biggest mode of, of moisture transport in, in the mid-latitudes. Now, this isn't my work, um, but it's, it's a really interesting paper from a few years ago using um, an auto-detection routine to, to pick up um, all the atmospheric rivers over a, um, a period of 30 years or so. And, and New Zealand comes out as somewhere that's, that's strongly influenced by these, maybe not as strongly as others in, in South America or, or Northwestern Europe, but it's still well picked out. What's maybe more important is the, the fraction of, of rain that comes from these systems. 
Um, and, and now we can see that um, New Zealand is, is one of the most strongly affected parts of the world in terms of the, the proportion of its annual rainfall that's precipitation that's attributable to these atmospheric rivers. Um, and that's, I suppose, because of the, the geography of the country. Um, we've got a, a three kilometre high barrier to the prevailing western wi westerly winds, leading to um, the orographic enhancement um, of, of rainfall associated with these features. So atmospheric rivers in general have become an increasingly popular topic over the last 10 years or so. But not too much has been done specifically focused on New Zealand um, to any great extent, aside from these global studies um, based on, on, on large global data sets rather than, um, rather than individual stations. So there are lots of questions that we can start to ask about these. Um, where, do they, where do they come from? What um, large-scale circulation situations uh, lead to their, their genesis? Um, and, and more locally, how do they vary across the country? Um, do they uh, affect all areas of the country equally? Um, are they always associated with the biggest uh, rain or, or river flow events? Um, or are there their, their non-atmospheric um, river mechanisms that are really important too. So I've been um, dabbling in this topic over the last few years, um, looking at uh, rain events um, and finding that they're associated with the biggest rain events, um, with the biggest snowfall events over the Southern Alps and also the biggest ablation events um, for, for glaciers there. Um, and for, for a whole range of different rivers. The, the largest river flow events, largest snow events, largest rain events are all linked to these atmospheric rivers. And this is just um, a, a few examples here. We've got um, uh, vertically integrated water vapour flux um, in the shading. So obviously the red in indicates more. Um, and we've got um, geopotential height in the, the, the lines indicating that they're all associated with these strong westerly or northwesterly winds and um, low pressure systems. So they are important for, for, um, for most um, hydrological extremes. Um, and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes um, in terms of uh, where they come from, um, what weather systems they're associated with, and the, the larger scale hemispheric situation we see, um, we see different configurations of, um, so this is uh, the geopotential height anomalies associated with these atmospheric rivers um, across the southern hemisphere. We can see um, positive anomalies, negative anomalies. We can see the, that southern hemisphere circulation um, relatively strong, relatively weak, uh, relatively close to the poles or, or far apart. Um, and associated with, with a, a relatively circular or a more wavy circulation. So it, it's not, there's not an, an easy, obvious uh, uh, pattern to pick out. Um, and that's some of the work um, that I'm doing now, um, with, partly with Bastion, trying to uh, pick out these, these wavy patterns in the Southern Hemisphere circulation and then whether we can pick out relationships across the southern hemisphere land masses, which in theory we should be able to, um, but it's a work in progress. So, um, so this is all, well, I think it's all quite interesting. Um, it's useful to understand the atmospheric processes that are delivering water. Um, but if we want to go beyond just pointing out patterns, um, maybe to, to looking at uh, forecasting or, or seasonal prediction or, or climate model projections, it's useful also to look at where that water is coming from. And, and here the, the, the name atmospheric river isn't, um, isn't maybe the most helpful. Um, we call them rivers and they look a bit like rivers. Um, and if we, if we plot the, the flux of water, so our, our flux of atmospheric water, um, 
along the low pressure system, we've got the low pressure here, the warm front here and the cold front here. We've got that flux along the, the warm conveyor belt area. It looks like, yes, we've got a river. But when we look more closely, they're not a river in the, the conventional sense of water flowing from A to B, um, uh, you know, along a pipe. Um, so, again, this isn't my work. Um, if we plot the, the system relative flux of water, because we've, our, our low pressure system is moving, right? So if we're in the Northern Hemisphere, in the North Atlantic, let's say, it's going to be moving in that um, northeasterly direction. If we look at the, the movement of water relative to that movement of the, the system itself, then actually we can see water being sucked into the, the low pressure system as it moves along its trajectory. So we've got two different movements of water here. We've got water uh, coming from the, the tropical region as the, the depression moves northwards, but we've also got water being locally um, advected into the system. So that, that gives us some, some more questions to ask, I suppose. What's more important if we're trying to work out where that water that's being delivered to us, where's it coming from? Is it the origin of the storm that's important um, or is it the, the surface conditions that the, the storm passes over? So local sea surface temperatures, how important are they in comparison to sea surface temperatures where that, that, uh, that storm initiated? So uh, one way we can investigate that issue is to um, do some hydrochemistry and look at uh, oxygen isotopes in water. So the two most common um, isotopes in water, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Oxygen 18 is heavier. So that means oxygen 16 is, is preferentially evaporated. Um, and oxygen 18 rains out um, preferentially. So if we're in a cold environment, then um, the, the water that gets evaporated is going to be depleted in oxygen 18, in the heavier one, because it's cold and there's not as much energy for evaporation. And then as, um, as uh, let's say, that, that air is lifted over a topographic feature, then oxygen 18 is going to get rained out first. So we'll get, again, depletion in oxygen 18. So just to demonstrate that, we've got a, an isoscape for, for New Zealand, for the South Island, and we can see that um, the depletion of oxygen 18 is, is less in the north compared to the south um, and is much greater in inland regions because we've got that orographic uplift. So uh, from some river water samples associated with a storm, what we've got here is um, a small subcatchment um, that you could just about see from the, my, my opening picture. And we've got a, a, a double flood event over the, the course of um, 24, 48 hours. So we've got our first um, river flow uh, peak, um, and then it subsides, and then we've got a second uh, smaller peak here. In the dots, we've got um, our oxygen 18 uh, depletion. So our first flood event um, not much happens, but then our second flood event, we can see this real spike in, in depletion associated with that. So if we, if we plot the, the atmospheric situation associated with that, um, our first uh, flood event, we've got our, our northwesterly um, atmospheric river uh, coming in from, from a, a, a northerly warm location. And then our second flow event, We've got an atmospheric river again, but this time coming in from the southwest, um, and we've got our big depletion spike. We can run some trajectories linked to that too, and that, that sort of matches up. So our first event, we've got our, our northerly air being, being sucked in, and then our second event, we've got that, that big southerly change. That's just, um, that's just one event. If we, and that's hourly data, we've have data for a period of about 18 months from that same location. Um, um, daily data, daily averages, um, and we've got our oxygen 18 depletion here. And so if we look at our, our 
um, events with relatively little depletion, we're, we're largely looking at northwesterly events. And if we look at all our events that are more depleted, we've got westerly or southwesterly events. So different weather patterns do seem to um, be associated with different air masses and different precipitation source regions. So we are getting some information about, yet we've got our, our mechanisms that are delivering us rain and, and information about where that water is coming from. It's not just sea surface temperatures in the, the, the Tasman Sea immediately upwind of the country. It's what's going on in that larger, that larger scale context that, that seems to be important. So um, at that point, We'll, um, we'll switch our, our focus slightly and we'll, we'll start to move um, onto, the, onto the leeward side of the Southern Alps. And we move from, from this really, really wet green and, 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 and snowy location to, to areas that are more, um, that, that have less water. We have um, some places in the, the immediate rain shadow um, this is the town of Alexandra, and it's pretty dry. Um, you can see uh, a largely brown landscape. Um, it gets hot in summer and it gets cold in winter. Um, so curling is the, the, the local sport in winter here where the, the lakes freeze over and, and you can go ice skating and do whatever you want on them. And midsummer we have temperatures um, up, in, up in the 30s. So a real continental climate, um, even though you know, we're maybe only 100 kilometres from the sea, 70 miles or so. And then as we move uh, from that immediate uh, rain shadow area, we move out to the, to the east coast. We have these large braided rivers uh, bringing water down from the southern Alps to the Pacific coast. It's, it's wetter here because there's some, there's some onshore wind. It looks lovely and green from this distance, but actually it, it's um, full of centre pivot irrigators. Um, so most of this is um, irrigated pasture for, for, um, for dairy and beef farming, which is one of the major industries of New Zealand. Also, we've got these, these big, big lakes um, downwind of the, the Southern Alps there. Most of them are lakes that, were, that are naturally there, but they're, they're strongly managed um, for hydropower. So um, about half of New Zealand's electricity comes from, from hydropower, and most of it from, from this part of the Southern Alps. So flooding is still important on this side of the country, but um, the use of water and, and um, the, the management of that resource becomes a, a much more pressing issue than it is on the West Coast. And so drought starts to become more of a concern, starts to have more of an impact. Looking at um, national scale drought, uh, first of all, standardised indices are, are quite useful to use um, because you're dealing with um, this huge range in precipitation climatology. So it's difficult to compare you know, the impact of a, a 50 millimetre uh, anomaly you know, in a really wet location to a really dry location. So um, the standardised precipitation ind index works by, by fitting rainfall to a statistical distribution and then looking at the anomaly from that distribution. And that way you're dealing with standardised numbers and you can compare much more easily. And then we can add in uh, precipitation minus evaporation to give us the meteorological water balance. The same principle with, with standardisation. And so if we look at a time series from 1979 through to about 2011, using the two different indices. Um, first of all, there's not much difference between um, the indices. Um, there are some, some drought-rich periods, so we've got the proportion of the country covered here to about 65%. Um, we've got drought-poor periods. There's no real trend here. You can draw a, a line through it, but it's a... Uh, it's not particularly convincing um, that, that, that drought has changed over, over this period um, or any indication that, that rising temperatures might be increasing the, the SPEI, our precipitation minus evaporation index. 
So there's not too much happening when you characterise like this, when you characterise drought like this on a national scale. If we um, zoom into particular regions, um, do a, um, a cluster analysis on, on, on our data set, and, and we pull this, this region pulls out here um, the, that rain shadow region moving out to the east coast. Then we start to see some, some change over time. Um, we see the highest uh, kind of regional drought occurrence. So here we've got drought coverage for this region. Um, uh, reaching 100% on, on, on quite a few occasions. There is some upward trend um, across this data set, um, but it's a relatively short data set to be drawing conclusions about trends. And, Unfortunately, it finished in 2011, so we, we missed the last few years, which have been particularly warm. Um, but we do see some, some increase in drought coverage and, and some divergence between our precipitation and our precipitation evaporation index. So here you can see that the, the SPEI almost always shows a greater drought coverage than, than um, the precipitation only index, which is sort of what we'd expect um, in a in a dry region, but also associated with increasing temperatures. And there's a, there is a relationship between the magnitude of this divergence and, and rising temperatures. And that sort of fits in with the general narrative about climate change producing a more extreme hydrological cycle and, um, and, and leading to greater drought occurrence. But when we move from, from our historical record into the future, it's, um, it's not quite so clear. So in New Zealand, drought events are linked to um, a, a weaker westerly circulation. So less uh, moisture flux, um, fewer storms. So this is, um, this is the, the anomaly in moisture flux in the shading and in, in circulation in the arrows associated with, with major drought events. So we've got a drop in moisture flux and we've got an easterly anomaly, um, so weaker westerly winds. But climate change is expected to increase the strength of the westerly circulation over New Zealand. Um, and so when we, when we run climate change scenarios through hydrological models, generally we see, uh, we see increases in river flow, or at least not much in the way of decrease. It's, it's complicated slightly in the South Island in particular by the, the changing uh, snow storage. Um, with reduced snow, reduced snow storage over winter. Um, and we can see that quite clearly in some instances. But generally, river flow doesn't really increase, and for many rivers it actually increases. But these are only averages, um, and there's, there's still some work to do to, to pull out what's happening behind these, this general wetter climate, and, and whether that's uh, whether that's being driven by extremes or how extremes play out in there. Um, but it's not, not a, a straightforward climate change, more drought narrative, certainly. Uh, that really, that's, that's something that, that, um, well, that people are working on at the moment. So uh, from, from drought as a, a, a meteorological event um, to, to thinking more about uh, water scarcity or, um, or, or not enough water to meet, um, meet, its, um, meet its users' requirements. And that's particularly an issue in these intermontane regions. So we've got the, the main spine of the Southern Alps and then we've got these, these secondary ranges that stop um, stop any um, east coast winds from, from penetrating. So we've got quite a dry climate, uh, precipitation often under 500 millimetres a year, but lots of water flowing through from these, from these big rivers. So we've got our, our water towers pumping water through, but we've got not much rain happening locally. And we've got this water being heavily used for hydropower um, and also for irrigation. The, the Lindis River is um, a really uh, interesting uh, kind of study in point. So it's located around about here. It's got mountain ranges on both sides. And if we zoom in, we can see that our, our river here is surrounded by lots of centre pivot irrigators. 
um, that really transform the landscape from the brown colour that it would usually be to you know, lush, green, um, lush green fields. And that's fed by irrigation. Uh, in the, the green, we've got um, uh, surface water takes and the, the blue are, are groundwater takes. And the river flows here and then it joins the much bigger Clutha River down here. And what happens in this river? Well, it runs dry in summer. Irrigation happens, but, but the, the river runs dry. We've got two, two gauges on the river. Um, the Lindis Peak uh, gauge, halfway up the catchment, where there's not much upstream, upstream irrigation. And then the Ardgar Road site, um, further downstream, where the, the effects of irrigation um, uh, are more severe. So we move from winter, where the downstream location has more water in the river, to um, the summer situation where the, the downstream gauge has, has less or no water in the river. Uh, obviously with, with quite severe effects for anything that wants to use the water in that river. So we've got irrigation, we've got a dry river. It sounds obvious, okay, irrigation bad. Um, but how bad is it? How much of an effect is that irrigation happen, having? It's a dry location. There's not much rain in the summer. Um, and we've got the difficulty of establishing what's the, the, the natural baseline conditions in the lower catchment. There's been a, a gauge in the upper catchment since the 1970s, so we've got a good idea of the hydrology of that situation. But the gauge in the lower catchment was only installed after irrigation really took hold. So. Um, it's a, it's a difficult question. How do you do that upstream-downstream comparison? So um, some work that I've been doing with some master's students is to, to run a hydrological model, um, set it up at this upstream location, and then apply it with, with minimal changes to the downstream location. So then the, the model should be giving us natural river flow and um, the observations give us the impacted river flow. So the results of that, looking at the, the number of days per year where the, the river doesn't, uh, where it dries up, where it doesn't connect with, with its um, downstream river. In the observations, we can see up to 140 days uh, per year. So that's pretty much constant from December through to April, where there's no water in the river um, in our observed record um, that, that goes back just over 10 years. And our, our modelled record, we do see some, some days where um, the, the river doesn't connect where it dries out, but nowhere near as many as, as what happens in reality, suggesting that yes, it is a case of these um, irrigation systems um, really substantially affecting the hydrology of the river. We can also run some climate change um, scenarios through, through the model to see what climate change will do to this. So the, the clear bars are the present day observations, the, the black bars, the present day model, and the, the different colours, you probably can't quite see behind that uh, board there, are our, our GCM simulations um, for, for later in the century. And climate change actually um, results in an increase in river flow because of that increase in the strength of the westerlies. So in a very simplistic way, climate change is good news for the amount of water in the river. But that's not, uh, that's not something I'd ever kind of put in a paper or, or broadcast because it's much more complicated than that. That depends on uh, farmers using the same amount of water that they presently do with an irrigation se season that, that doesn't extend um, through the shoulder season, the, the same sort of crops, the same management regime. But it is interesting it show that, that climate change doesn't necessarily result in a worsening of the water resource situation here, but is something that will require careful management. So from, um, from direct withdrawals from um, a river to, to more indirect effects on the amount of uh, water in a river through, through land use change again, through what's done in the catchment. So moving along to the east coast now, 
to a relatively small catchment, um, about 400 square kilometres, um, and sort of nice rolling countryside up to peaks of, of maybe six or 700 metres. Uh, and we've got no irrigation, but we've got agriculture in the, the lower part of the catchment in terms of commercial forestry and um, pasture. And then the upper catchment being largely natural, but, but still uh, with low, inten low intensity sheep grazing. So um, an, another master's student of mine um, did uh, some, some land use change modelling, looking at different scenarios of, um, of more intensive agriculture, um, letting the, the, the catchment revert to, to native grasses and, and shrubs um, or, or complete forestry. And, and the work showed that replacing the existing commercial agriculture with, with, um, with natural grasses and allowing it to revert to areas to revert to um, scrub, woody biomass, um, could actually increase um, mean annual low flow um, by, by quite a substantial amount. So even when we're not actively pumping water from the river or from the groundwater, what happens in, in these catchments um, by way of farming and forestry can, be, can have a, a really big impact. Finally, um, land use and water resources from, slight, from a slightly different perspective um, and not from, from taking water out of the catchment but um, adding water to the catchment. So this is, um, this is a, a, an iconic uh, landscape in um, the, the high country of the South Island. We've got these tussock grasses covering um, the hills and our peaks, um, you know, maybe, maybe up to a thousand metres, um, covered in this, this tussock grass, these, um, well, these big tussocks of grass that are maybe about 75 centimetres high. Um, in many places, these, these tussock landscapes have been uh, heavily grazed um, by sheep or they've been replaced by um, exotic pasture. Um, and when this has happened, there's been a tendency for these catchments to, um, to, to produce less water. The water yield from the catchment drops. And there have been two, there's been lots of work done on this, um, partly from a, a, a conservation perspective and that people want to People who aren't farmers uh, want to keep the landscape like this and well, farmers want to make a living and the country needs money and so on. Um, so there have been two explanations for why um, damage or, or loss of tussock results in this reduced water yield. And one is, um, a, I suppose, a biological explanation in that tussocks are, are really well adapted to these, um, these intermontane locations. They're very good at uh, closing the stomata in situations of water stress. Um, so stopping that, that flow of water out from the soil into the atmosphere. And the, the other explanation is fog deposition. So you can see the, the sort of structure of tussocks, lots of really thin um, tillers um, extending out. And they're, they're, they're relatively high for grass. And a lot of these locations, you know, say about a thousand metres, correspond to um, the, the cloud base during, during certain um, weather situations. And so they're really good at scavenging that moisture out from the atmosphere when we've got um, this low cloud. It's been a contentious subject because it's, it's proven difficult to quantify the water balance um, in these tussock landscapes. Previous, um, previous studies have used um, lysimeters, weighing lysimeters and non-weighing lysimeters, um, eddy covariance to, to try and work out what the fluxes are leaving the surface, um, hydrological models um, based on observations of, of rainfall and simulation of evaporation, um, and also fog collectors, um, which is what we've got here. Um, Basically, we've got fishing wire extent, um, uh, strung up in a cross section uh, with a, a gutter below over a tipping bucket rain gauge um, and a lid to try and stop the rain coming in. And so this is, this is some work that I've been doing over the last few years using a series of these, um, these passive um, harp-style fog collectors to estimate 
um, the amount of fog water that, that gets deposited or scavenged out of the atmosphere on these, ca these catchments. And we've got a, a series of locations here um, where the fog uh, component, well, the, the additional fog to, to rainfall totals varies from, from just about negligible to, to quite substantial, still a, mi still a minority, but, but a fair amount. The, the reason for such variation and, and variation in, in results from previous studies too seems to come from the, the altitude of the site that you test. If it's linked to, to low cloud rather than ground-based fog, then altitude is critical as to whether um, the, the cloud grazes the top of it or not. Um, and also the, the proximity to the coast and the, um, the occurrence of um, these moist uh, northeasterly winds or southwesterly winds um, over the catchment. But uh, zooming in, in here in the moment, um, fog can actually uh, result in relatively large uh, amounts of water. I shouldn't call it precipitation because it's, it's not technically precipitation. Uh, because it's not moving downward. Um, but looking at the largest fog event from this coastal location, 35 millimetres over 32 hours, is a, a reasonable amount. Um, not as much as rain still, but a reasonable amount. And why it's also important is because it doesn't always occur at the same time as, as rain events. Sometimes it's like the, the precursor as the, the cloud starts to thicken. But in some um, some instances it occurs with completely different weather systems um, in complete isolation from rain. So it can be an important uh, contributor to the, the catchment um, or to parts of the catchment um, and goes some way towards explaining this, this, extra, um, this extra water that these catchments have. How important it really is on a catchment perspective though, I think there's still some work to be done um, because um, the fog might deposit a lot of water at the top of the catchment. But again, if we're talking about low cloud um, coinciding with the top of the catchment, it might only be the top 10 metres of the catchment, um, you know, of a catchment that, that starts off at six or 700 metres and goes down to sea level. Whereas a rain event, will cover most of the headwaters, typically. Um, so um, we've got water over a much larger area of catchment compared to um, a fog event, maybe. That's a work in progress still. Um, but it certainly play, plays a role. So that's about where I will um, finish up. Um, taking you on a journey from, from uh, north west to southeast, looking at large-scale atmospheric circulation patterns and how they contribute to delivering water to the, to the South Island in particular, how the, the landscape modifies that, uh, that meteorological um, situation, and then what happens to the water after it's de been deposited at the surface, whether it's been enhanced by the, the, the nature of land use at the surface, whether it's been subtracted from directly or indirectly, and, and these are all the things that, that we need to think about when we're finally moving on to think about, well, how much rain do we have here? How much water do we have? Um, and, and what are the controls on, on these hydro hazards, drought, flood and, and water scarcity? So I'll just finish with some acknowledgements. Um, I'm here in Britain and partly funded by the University of Birmingham um, Vanguard scheme. A lot of the work that I've been presented has been at least in part the work of a, a range of postgraduate students over the last few years um, and, and various other contributors too. So thank you. <laughs>